We started last week with a new sermon series talking about the last words of Christ and we're comparing them to different situations that's happened in Jesus' ministry. Now, Debbie, I was going to have you start a video. I think I'm going to have you pause on that for a second and I'm going to have you show it a little bit later in the sermon. So I'll direct you and tell you when that's going to happen. But last week I told you to imagine if you were there and you saw a paralytic being healed. This week... I want you to imagine you're in first century time and imagine that you have a seat next to Jesus getting to hear him teach. Wouldn't that be phenomenal? Just to be able to sit down right beside him and say, and, and just listen. I wouldn't even talk, I'd just listen. Okay, yes, yes, okay, yes. Now imagine you see another guy come and sit down, a young guy. Looks like he's pretty well-to-do. And he's listening to what Jesus is saying, and he's shaking his head yes, and, and listen to what he has to say. And at the end of Jesus talking, had a couple different things happen. One, in this situation, there's a number of little children who are around and they want to come up and see Jesus and you see the, the disciples trying to hold them back and Jesus is like wait no no you let the little children come to me what I'm telling you is a story we find in Mark 10 you can turn in your Bibles over there because we'll be there in just a minute but then after this time this young man who's kind of stuck around he goes up to Jesus and he wants to talk to him. And now what we're going to see is this young man and then we're going to turn around and see another person. And we're going to get two different perspectives. That's my first point this morning. This first point is going to be all about two different perspectives. Two different perspectives. The first perspective is in Mark 10, starting with verse 17. And it's this. This is what it says here. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this a man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This rich young ruler followed all the rules, kept all the commandments, Can't you imagine what he thought at first? He goes, I've got this in the bag. I've got this wrapped up. Jesus might tell me one other thing, other thing I need to do. And it even says there, he looked at him and he loved him. And then he probably had this big smile on his face. And then when Jesus says, go sell your possessions, can't you see that smile dropping? To a frown. And him maybe backing up. Maybe a little uncomfortable. Putting his head down. Because this guy's rich. And he doesn't want to give it away. You see this guy. And then Jesus goes down further in the chapter. And says... In verses, 
and says in verses 26 and 27, he says the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now I want you to tuck that thought away as we go through the sermon. We'll come back to this. But now just imagine this young man. Imagine he made a trip to Jerusalem on the Passover. Imagine he is there and he walks by and he sees Jesus on the cross. And imagine he comes walking through at the account that we find in Luke 23. In Luke 23, Jesus is dealing with the two thieves. And listen to what it says. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief and the rich young ruler. You couldn't have two opposite people. You couldn't have any different people. You had a rich young ruler who followed the laws. Dotted every I, crossed every T. He had them down. And you had a thief who broke the law. A thief who took things from people and got caught and was put on a cross to hang justly for a punishment that he deserved. Yet Jesus tells the thief, what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. And that rich young ruler, what did he do? Put his head down and walked away. Two completely different perspectives from two completely different people. And if this story was told in the world, it would be the exact opposite. Oh, he did all these good things. Yeah, he's fine. He's good to go. Oh, that thief, he's no good. He's done for. That's it. But remember, it was the thief who Jesus said, I truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. I have a video I want to show you. It's from the perspective of that rich young ruler. I wonder what he would think. This may be how he thought. Debbie, would you play the video? Maybe this is what that rich young ruler thought. We don't know about his life after he walked away. Maybe he saw what Jesus was saying and he changed. He gave his life to him. But let's say he didn't. Let's say he's mad and saying, why is this bad guy getting this? He doesn't deserve this. Why is this guy on the cross getting eternal life? Why is he getting to go to paradise? If you took it from the way he was in the video, he was saying he's not getting what he deserves. That he should be getting that because he felt like he deserved it because he did all these good things. 
Well, let's talk about that this morning. Let's talk about getting what we deserve. Point two this morning. Let's talk about getting what we deserve. I find it interesting when we look at that thief on the cross. When we look at that thief on the cross, he was getting what he deserved, right? He was hung up there because he committed a crime. And the punishment for the crime was crucifixion. So he was getting the punishment for the crime. We normally don't complain about that. We normally don't complain. Even he himself said that they deserved it. Remember in Luke 23, 41, the thief said, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. He says it. He agrees with us. Now, do we complain when somebody is sentenced today? Do we complain when they're justly sentenced and... They're punished? No. We don't complain. You think of all the the horrible bad people out there, the serial killers and things, like a Ted Bundy or some of them. When they were captured, what were what were people saying? There's a book at them. You think of the different people who have been punished. They deserve what they get. And then flip that over. When people are just a really good person, they do all these great things, and they do all these good things, we feel like that they deserve good things. They're always so good, and they're always so nice, and they always do all these good things. Oh, boy, they, 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 they should just... They should be getting all these good things. That's what the rich young ruler thought when he was talking to Jesus. Remember his words, Mark 10, 17. Good teacher. Now listen here. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Because he's done this and this and this. He did, he did, he did, he did, he did. And now what else do I have to do? Look at all my accomplishments. Don't I deserve heaven? Look at all my accomplishments. Don't I deserve to be in heaven? There are many people in this world today who feel that way. Their good outweighs their bad. And they deserve heaven. I mean, what type of God wouldn't let me go to heaven? I deserve heaven. But that's not how God grades. It's not a pass-fail course. You don't get 60%. You know how it was in school? It was in some schools 60, some schools 65, different places. You get that, you pass. That's not how God grades. I love, his, I love the words in Isaiah 64, verse 6, which says this. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. See, at the time this is written, written, Israel, you know, God's chosen people, were still doing good things, like offering sacrifices, doing things like that, but they were turning around and doing other things too, like idol worship. They were doing some things good and some things bad. And God said all those good acts, 
What are they worth? What are they worth if you're doing all these other things? What they did, what the Israelite people at the time was doing was horrible. They were sinning. And the problem is, we've all done it. We've all sinned. We've all given up to the, given to the idol of something. Lust, greed, pride, you name it. We've all succumbed to some different idol. We've all sinned. We have all failed at some time. I like the way James puts it. James chapter 2 verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So we see God's grading scale. You miss one, you fail. You're perfect, you pass. Just a quick check. Raise your hand if you're perfect. I better put mine down real quick. Because I'm not perfect either. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, a very familiar verse. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let's take it a step further. We've all sinned. We're not perfect. So what's next? We'll just skip over a couple chapters. Romans 6, 23. I'll just read the first half of the verse. For the wages of sin is death. So, our wages, what we have earned, what we deserve, is death. The rich young ruler is saying, you know, I I deserve, I deserve, I've done, I've done, I've done, I've done. Yeah, you have done. You've sinned here, you've sinned there, you've sinned over here, and the wages of sin is death. So if we get what we deserve, then we all deserve hell. Love the words of Martin Luther who wrote, The most pernicious heresy that ever plagued the mind of man is that somehow he can make himself good enough to deserve to live forever with an all-holy God. Let that sink in for a second. Somehow we can make ourselves good enough to serve all, to be with an all-holy God. We don't deserve God. None of us do. That's why in the Old Testament, over and over again, when they were talking about the things they were doing... They were trying not to focus it in a way to where it was, look at what you're doing, look at what I'm doing. Let me give you a couple of examples. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, By keeping all his statutes and commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Before he gets into the what God wanted them to do, the focus was fear God. Because God's the point. Go a little bit further. Deuteronomy 8, 6. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways, and fearing him. The point was God. Now look what I can do. The focus isn't the work, it's their hearts. What's in their heart? It's not a checklist. It's not a checklist. That's not good enough. 
That rich young ruler could bring a billion checklists and that wouldn't matter because all it focuses on is, look what I did. Jesus is telling him, focus on God. Focus on God. Not on what I did. Which leads to my third point this morning. Getting what we don't deserve. Getting what we don't deserve. And that is the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross. A man who was caught doing wrong and found guilty. A man who was sentenced to death. Death on a cross. Now remember, he wasn't the only thief that was up there. There was another guy with him who was caught stealing, who was found guilty, who was hanging on a cross. Two of them. One of the thieves is just acting like everybody else. Mocking God. The other thief, he saw God and figured out real quick it wasn't about him. He realized who Jesus was. I mean, look back at what he said here. Luke 23, verses 40 through 42. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Can't you just hear him saying this? Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence... We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus sees his heart and he tells him. Or, and, and this man says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief knew he couldn't do anything to save himself. He couldn't do one thing to save himself. He was done. No chance. He needed help. He couldn't do it on his own. He asked for help. That thief is us. There's nothing we can do to go to heaven on our own. Nothing. There's no special secret act that you can do that can guarantee you a trip to heaven. We can't do it on our own. We need help. We need Jesus. Which just reminds us of one thing. God's pretty awesome. God is awesome. You stop and think about that whole thing for a second. We couldn't ask for a better God. Who is willing to give us what we don't deserve. He gave us this, he made this world, creation. He made us. And then we go and mess it up. And he says, I'll give you a way to be with me. But it's only through Jesus. We can't do this on our own. We don't deserve it, but it's freely given to us. So if you don't know God, I think the thief's words match us very well. When we ask, remember me? Remember me? Because we know who God is. Because he wants to tell us today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will join me in heaven. He wants to tell us that. 
But we have to accept, as the rich young ruler was figuring out in the video, that it's a gift. That it's a gift. A gift that we do not deserve. See, here's the thing about it. We can't earn salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Jesus paid the price. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus did the work. But what do we got to do? It's very simple. We accept the gift. Think of it like this. You get a present. Somebody brings you a present. Now, it may be your birthday, it may be Christmas, it may just be, hey, I want to give you a present today. But they walk up to you with a box with it wrapped with a bow on it, and they say, here's a gift. So we take the gift. Now, when we take the gift, we still take off the bow. We still take off the wrapping paper. Some are very meticulous. Now, take it off real easy so they can save it and use it for some, to wrap somebody else's present. Or, like, if you're at my house, it would be ripped into 50 million shreds of paper as we still find three weeks after Christmas or a birthday is done. But we take off the wrapping paper. And then we open the box. And there's the gift. Now... Did we earn the gift? No. Did anything we just do there earn the gift? The gift was given to us. We just opened the present. Jesus offers us salvation through grace. We accept the gift. We take off the bow, or we confess Jesus is Lord and Savior. We unwrap the paper. We say we're going to repent and start changing our ways, not living like we used to anymore. We open the box. We're baptized into him. still don't deserve the gift but we receive it this morning if you don't have Jesus he wants to give you the gift and that gift is better as a better gift that any of us can ever give anybody it is salvation he wants to give us a gift can receive the gift. If you don't know Jesus, why don't you come forward now and make Jesus your Lord and Savior? Accept the gift. Be like that thief who didn't deserve eternal life either, just like we don't deserve eternal life. And say you'll accept the gift. You can do that today. Julie, why don't you come on up? See, our worship team's a little smaller this morning, so I just have to ask one person to come up. But we're going to sing a song of invitation. Butch is going to come forward uh, when we all stand up here in a second. And if you want to make a decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come forward. Butch will be standing here. We're going to sing, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Ask God today to create in you a clean heart. You can do that today. Won't you all stand and sing? Sing with us.